Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppas, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Margaret Redsteer. Of Crow descent, Redsteer is a research scientist focused on geology, landscape ecology, water quality, climate change, and its impacts on Native American communities, and tracking the history of these impacts using local and traditional knowledge. Red Steer, along with Carletta Chief, Assistant Professor of Soil, Water, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Arizona, were keynote speakers for the Climate Change and Indigenous Peoples Lecture on May 9, 2018, sponsored by the Clark Honors College and the Environmental Studies Program. The lecture was the opening event in the Environmental Justice, Race, and Public Land Symposium held at UO from May 9 to 11, 2018. Thank you, Margaret, for coming on the show. My pleasure. First, tell us a bit about your journey to becoming a scientist who works at the intersection of applied science and indigenous knowledge. How did you wind up doing that? It was absolutely accidental. As a young mother, um, I actually lived on the Navajo Nation and was planning to be there and raise my children um, without going to college. but. Uh, because of uh, some laws that were passed that divided the Navajo Nation um, joint use area, or I should say tribal lands ju joint use area between the Hopi, the Navajo, and the Paiute, um, the area where we, li we were living ended up being part of the Hopi reservation. And um, we were um, essentially given uh, the finances to move off. And at that point, I realized that uh, I needed to do something to help um, support my family. And it was very hard with a high school degree to get a job that would even pay for a babysitter. So that's when I decided to go to college. And because we had spent so much of our time just trying to find decent water to haul where we lived, I decided that water resources would be a great place to 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 uh, to start my studies. Um, and environmental science was something that I was really interested in too, because of the poor water quality, not just on the Navajo Nation, but on tribal lands in Montana. So tell us about the current condition of landscape ecology and water supplies in the Navajo lands of the Southwest. What's what's going on there now? Um, well, there's a, a great um, a great deal of change over the 20th century. A lot of springs uh, that were flowing at the beginning of the 20th century or even 20 or 30 years ago are now dry. Um, a lot of the rivers and lakes that used to be full all the time and rivers that would flow all year are now only flowing during really high periods of moisture, big, big rainfall or snowfall events so only during floods. And um, so the, the number of places where people can get water is declining. Um, of course, there are municipal sources too, uh, but there are probably about 40% 40, 40 of the tribe still hauls water and they don't have running water in their homes. And so those people are going farther and farther to look for water and spending more money getting water. And what kind of impacts are there on the other life forms that are there? I mean, the, the entire uh, ecology of the environment must be being impacted by this decline in water supplies. Right, because the river systems uh, don't support the same kind of vegetation that they did in the past. Um, they're a lot drier, and as a result, there's a lot of sediment that's in those river systems that now blows when it gets windy, so you end up with a lot of sand and dust blowing out of the river systems that used to have water flowing in them. Um, the animals that rely on that water, um, a lot of them are gone. Beaver used to be very common on the reservation and now it's not. Um, a lot of migrating birds don't go through there anymore either. And does this have an impact on the uh, the farming practices, the grazing practices? I mean, the the tribe they farm sheep. I understand. Has that been impacted as well? Yeah, um, actually, in the seventies, sixties, and seventies, people started to shift away from sheep towards other livestock like cattle, simply because um, if you only have a few animals to begin with, because the forage is low, 
you have to get a job. Mm -hmm. And if you have to get a job, you're not going to be able to tend your herds. Mm -hmm. And so cattle do really well on their own. And so there's been a shift away from sheep to cattle. And people have trouble farming. There's not a lot of uh, water available for irrigating crops. So that's also been really limiting. And plus, again, if the rangeland and the conditions are not amenable to you being able to live off the land anymore because it's getting a, to be a harsher and drier climate and you need a job, you know, farming is a pretty uh, labor intensive mm -hmm. um, thing to do. And so a lot of times people have put it aside because of that too, because they just don't have the time. So one of the notable things about your work as a research scientist is that you bring into your work uh, local indigenous knowledge. So first of all, tell us how you go about doing that. How do you combine sort of scientific processes with this local knowledge? How do you go about doing that? Um, the first thing is to have people in the community that are really interested in their own history and their own local knowledge that partner with you. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not a native Navajo speaker, and a lot of things can get lost in translation, and you have to have people who are really knowledgeable of the culture themselves to partner with you on something like that. So I've worked with Clara Kelly and Harris Francis, who were instrumental in, um, in developing the Navajo Historic Preservation Office. And, um, and they essentially have been my collaborators in that effort. So tell me how you, um, how the knowledge of elders, uh, Nav Navajo elders, is contributing to the research that you're doing. Well, one of the big things that uh, is a challenge to doing work on the Navajo Nation is there isn't, hasn't been a lot of scientific studies in the past. Mm -hmm. There are some historical records, um, but there isn't a lot of, there isn't a great database of, of work that's been done there before. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a lot of information on environmental change. There isn't a lot of information on weather conditions and how they've changed over time. And there aren't even a lot of weather stations. Mm -hmm. um, the weather stations actually are in a lot of the national park lands and monuments around the reservation that are actually on reservation lands. And so the area hasn't been, um, changes in the area haven't been documented very well by conventional scientific uh, methods. And so to get an idea of how changes have occurred, um, really the, the best resource is the people who have lived there their whole lives and seen all of the changes take place. And they have a great deal of information. So you've, you've done interviews with a lot of these people, I understand. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's not just the person who, you know, lives down at the end of the block necessarily. It's the person who has spent their life gathering traditional meth medicines or the person who is a ceremonialist who is well known in their community. They're the people who really have an idea of what kind of environmental change has happened, where they find their plant medicines, um, how different years have. How, how environmental conditions have fluctuated from one year to the next. So you have to look for the people who are known for their knowledge of, of culture and ceremonies and medicines to really uh, get a good understanding of the changes that have happened. So if I'm a, um, I'm a skeptical scientist and I say, well, okay, you're talking to these people and they're telling you what they remember, but memory is not reliable. How do you know that the stuff they're telling you about changes in the climate actually are true? Because they match very, very closely with the meteorological records. People will mention a flood, you know, that happened at a particular period of time. And going through all of the data, I might not have seen it the first time around. <laughs> but if I go and look at the data carefully, there it is. Um, and so um, what it's helped me do is take observations that are in specific points, essentially meteorolog uh, meteorological observations that are in specific points and be able to extrapolate that to a region and say, okay, this isn't data that just is representative of this particular place, mm -hmm. but it's actually representative of this particular region. 
because it matches up so well with the observations of the people who live there. So um, you're, you've, you've done this collaborative work, you've um, come to certain conclusions about the, 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 the sort of the extensiveness of climate change and the fact that these changes are continuing. Um, how, how are members of the Navajo Nation responding to this knowledge that climate change is advancing relentlessly? Are they, how are they adapting? It really depends on the people. Um, elderly people are not surprised at all by this. They know that the changes are happening and they're worried for the future. And there are young people who are very, very interested in doing what they can mm -hmm. to help. And there have been a number of young people who are sort of in the transition stage between high school and trying to figure out what they're gonna do um, in college or as a professional career who are often really uh, working hard at the local level to see what they can do to help the community. Um, and so it's not as if people are sitting idly by and saying this isn't a problem. But I think what the scientific studies do is they help acknowledge the change that people have seen so if they realize it's not just something in their imagination mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. as you and I know, when we're, we're going to work every day, we may be confronted by this really strange weather event or something like that and go, wow, that's really weird, but you know, maybe that happened in the past and I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. So it's good to get that validation. Um, and then it also provides them with more detailed information that they might not have had otherwise about some of the strategies that they might uh, think about um, based on the changes that we're seeing, the fact that water resources are declining, that wind energy is becoming a, a significant issue, um, and just providing some strategies for how to uh, mitigate some of the changes that they're seeing. Can you say something about some of those strategies? I know, for example, I watched the documentary um, that, you pr that you're an executive producer on, and it, one of the th things it talks about is this movement of the sand dunes because um, it's so dry and the sand is just blowing all over the place, and the landscape is actually radically changing in configuration, and these dunes are taking over people's homes. Right. So what are some they of the are. things that people are doing? I mean, how it's are they? It's pretty difficult. Yeah. And one of the issues is how much land, how much land are you gonna actually plan infrastructure on the downwind side of streams and washes that are now dry um, and the wind is blowing the sediment out of them. Essentially, um, in a way it helps you plan to well, let's put the housings on the housing on the upwind side. Um, let's think about um, how much we can assist the vegetation that's there, the native vegetation, and when there is a wet period, try to do something to reintroduce native seeds. I, there's a section in that doc, particular documentary you're talking about where we do just that. We make seed pellets and redistribute them um, on sand dunes. Um, in the areas where there's lower wind energy, hoping that they'll germinate and help revegetate some areas because you can't simply just uh, ignore the problem. It's, um, it's in the, this a kind of situation where without intervention, things will just get worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know um, from reading your bio that over the course of your, t your career, You've had a number of important mentors who have supported you and helped guide you as you went forward. Um, how do you understand your own role as a mentor, as a as a scientist of native descent, and and you know how you understand that part of what you do? Well, I think that nobody can actually have a career without without communicating and collaborating and support from others and the people who think they've done it all by themselves are just fooling themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all rely on each other and we rely, 
rely, rely on different viewpoints and perspectives to really strengthen our own body of knowledge. You always learn more when you work with other people and get other perspectives. Um, and I've been really lucky to have people who have helped me along the way at really critical stages when I was discouraged and wasn't sure I was going to keep going. And, uh, and I hope to help people that way too, although I have to say that sometimes as a Native American scientist, you kind of hope that your role will be also recognized as a scientist, mm -hmm. not just as somebody who can be an example for mm -hmm. other Native people, but be recognized as a scientist. Um, and that's the big, ch I think one of the biggest challenges of our time is to be recognized just for our contribution to science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see. Um, you're you're, you're uh, giving this keynote uh, lecture at, uh, uh, tonight with Carletta Chief, Assistant Professor of Soil, Water, and Environmental Sciences at uh, Arizona, the University of Arizona. Tell me, um, uh, how did you get to know about Chief and how you started to work together and, and what kind of collaborations you've done or are going to do? Say something about that. Yeah, Carlotta's been very well known on the Navajo Nation for many years. She was actually Miss Navajo Nation at one point <laughs> before she went to graduate school. Um, but I had the, the opportunity and the pleasure to meet her when she was participating in a program called the MS PhDs program which is for graduate students from underrepresented groups. And so I was her mentor in that program and went to a science conference with her. Um, and that's how we first got to know each other. And since then, we've collaborated on a number of publications. Um, can you say anything about any of those? Tell us a little bit about what they're well, concerned with. And um, one of them was actually a report for the National Climate Assessment um, on the tribes in the southwestern U.S. and it was the first time there was a chapter concerning um, how tribes are affected and um, what kind of issues are confronting tribes with climate change. So it was the first time the climate assessment actually included a chapter on tribes and Carletta was one of my co-authors on that. Um, do you think that th this, th um, well, I, I, it must be the case. Can you say something about um, the impacts of climate change, um, not just on the sort of the way of life of the Navajo in, in this area, but um, is it impacting their cultural practices? Um, I mean, I could imagine, for example, that there might be um, well, you mentioned n native medicines, for example, that are now becoming much more difficult to uh, access because the plants are no, no longer there. Are there are there kinds of cultural impacts from from this climate change? I mean, we've talked about, you know, that the, that the the water has impacted other life forms, non-human life that's there. But what about the sort of cultural practices of the Navajo Nation? How is that? How are they holding up in the face of these changes? Well, what you think of when you think of Navajo people is people who herd sheep, people who weave rugs, who, people who grow corn, and all of those things have changed. Um, people, very few people still have sheep herds now. Mm -hmm. um, there's a group called Sheep is Life that are trying to keep um, weaving and sheep herding alive at this point because it is so rare. Um, so that's endangering a lot of the arts. Um, it's endangering a lot of the culture. Um, every Navajo ceremony includes corn pollen, and that corn pollen is supposed to be from corn that you've grown, um, that you've collected yourself. And people don't have cornfields anymore. They're working in Phoenix or wherever, and. Mm -hmm. They're not doing the same things that they were doing before because the climate just is too harsh for those things to continue. So are they uh, g getting the corn pollen from elsewhere or are they changing the ceremonies or what, what kinds of things are happening? They're getting the corn pollen from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is now there's sort of a little bit of a problem with corn, corn pollen because uh, 
it'll be sold at flea markets and things like that, and it gets diluted with mm -hmm. things like cornstarch that people buy off the shelf and mix in with it um, mm. to try to make it go farther and things like that. So it's not quite the same as corn pollen you collect yourself. Mm. So adaptation is necessary and continuing. I mean, the cultural adaptation, the Navajo are changing their ways to confront these realities. They are. Does, is it your sense, uh, um, how, how has, the, has the interest or the offer or the activity of scientists been received on the reservation on, in the Navajo Nation? Do they, are they receptive? Oh yeah, very much so. Although there's this dichotomy between where tribal revenues come from mm. and what scientific observations show. Because like a lot of tribes, um, they have very limited revenues, very limited economic bases. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of their revenue comes from coal and from natural gas, um, and they're not the only tribe that has this issue, mm -hmm. um, they're sort of looking for ways that they can diversify their economy, but those, those things have not really come to fruition the way they've been imagined for many, many years. Even back in the 1970s when um, tribes began to develop um, coal and uh, sort of assert their sovereignty over the way their natural resources would be managed, mm -hmm they knew that this was something that they had to be able to use to, as a stepping stone to invest in something else. But because of the challenges of being in a remote area with limited water supplies and things like that and a harsh climate, um, it's been really difficult for them to find other, way, other sources of economic revenue to, to take the place of coal. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So um, I know, um, from you telling me just before we began speaking that you're um, going to be starting a new job in the fall. I am. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, I'm very excited. It's going to be uh, a position at the Faculty of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington in Bothell. And interdisciplinary uh, work is really uh, important for understanding climate change. It's not just a physical science perspective that we need, but it's also bringing people to the table and all of the other sciences together in order to tackle a problem like this. And do you know, um, I mean, you're, you're relocating from the Southwest to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Uh, what are you imagining, how do you imagine that shift is gonna impact your work? Are you gonna continue to focus your research in the Southwest or are you gonna change your focus? you have any idea about that? Well, I'm definitely going to finish working on the research that I'm doing now, but I'm hoping to also branch out a little bit. Um, currently, I have started working with the Hopi tribe, too, because I've worked on sand dunes quite a bit, and traditional Hopi agriculture also targets sand dunes. Sand dunes are very porous and permeable, and because of that, they've been key to the success of, of Hopi rain-fed agriculture. And so they're very interested in learning more about what science can tell them about the specific characteristics of sand dunes that they've used in their traditional agriculture to help guide them in, in, their, um, in their efforts to continue their traditional agricultural practices because they also realize that things are getting hotter and drier where they live. Mm -hmm. And they're situated in the middle of the Navajo Nation, so. And do you anticipate working with any of the Northwest tribes when you're when you're relocated? I certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. Do you know any of the? I mean, obviously the um, the environmental context is quite different uh, up around here. Absolutely. Um, but it's certainly. I mean, there are large sections of the Eastern Oregon that are drought prone and. Um, do you know what some of the kinds of environmental challenges that, that uh, tribes in the Northwest are facing? Sure. 
Um, they still have the same kind of issues of declining snowfall that we all have across the western U.S. And because of the changes in the way um, precipitation um, is occurring, sediment transport changes. So they'll take sedimentation, sedimentation along coastlines, sea level rise, all of those things are still sediment transport issues. And what I've done in the Southwest is primarily focus on sediment transport from streams to, um, to windblown sand, but it's not that much different than what happens in a deltaic sedimentation situation, except that then you're throwing sea level rise on top of that and you have a whole another ball of wax. But the same kinds of things are happening um, throughout the western U.S. and that is that we're getting declining snowfall mm -hmm. and larger precipitation events that are spaced farther apart. And so what those do on the landscape and how the landscape interacts with those things is what I'm really interested in because that's essentially the critical zone where life begins is on that surface where the plants thrive and, and then all of us depend on where those water resources are and where those plant resources are. Um, I guess my final question for you is, um, do you know what the next sort of big project that you're gonna undertake is gonna be? Is there, uh, I mean, is there a specific category or sub area of what you were just describing that's the next big thing for you, the next big focus for you? Well, I'm open to a lot of different uh, ideas, but I think right now my 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 new big thing is is essentially um, understanding a lot more about the history of sand dunes on the Hopi um, mesas, because sand dunes are are deposits that are on the surface that blow around every time there's a drought. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to understand their history because there's a, a way of dating the sediment in the sand dunes because quartz will actually um, record the last time it was exposed to sunlight. Hmm. So there's this um, dating technique that's uh, luminescence dating that will tell you when that, when that grain was buried. But if that sand grain keeps getting repeatedly exposed every time there's a drought, there's no way to know that. But if you're in a situation where you have mesas that have um, canyons in them that are um, places out of the wind that the sand blows into and then is preserved, which is the situation you have on Hopi, then you have a whole repository of drought history for uh, the Colorado Plateau. Hmm. Well, I have to stop you there. Okay. Good luck on that project. It sounds fascinating. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. You're welcome. I've been speaking with Margaret Redsteer. She was one of the keynote speakers for the Climate Change and Indigenous Peoples Lecture on May 9th, 2018, sponsored by the Clark Honors College and the Environmental Studies Program. The lecture was the opening event in the Environmental Justice, Race, and Public Land Symposium held at UO May 9th through 11th, 2018. Thanks so much for watching.